Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vivian Bird, the STEAM librarian for the Exploration and Creativity Department of Los Angeles Public Library. And I'm here to introduce today's Maker Talks. Please feel free to use the chat box to communicate your thoughts, comments, and questions throughout the program. We'll be answering your questions after our guest speaker's presentation. We would also like to take this opportunity to recognize and acknowledge the first people of this land, honoring their elders, past and present, as well as their descendants who are citizens of these nations. For more information on which territory you may reside on, please check out native-land.ca. I also want to thank our Library Foundation and our behind the scenes staff for helping us bring these virtual programs to you. If you like our programs today, please don't forget to check out our online calendar regularly at lapl.org slash events. We have so many amazing and fun programs lining up for different age groups. Now on to our Maker Talks. Maker Talks is a program featuring makers of all backgrounds from Los Angeles and beyond who make things. A maker can be someone who builds Mars rovers and robots all the way to those who embrace the traditional techniques of woodworking, knitting, and winemaking. Makers are innovators. They hack and repurpose existing and outdated technologies, equipment, and knowledge, and take what we already knew and give it a new use and life. So, if you or anyone you know who are makers, please fill out a presenter interest form at bit.ly slash LAPLmaker. We would love to feature you in our next Maker Talks. The maker I'm introducing today is Lumila Limke or Ludi. Ludi is a maker, a professor, and a fashion and textile design designer and the founder of fashionchalkboard.com. Today, Ludi will be sharing with us her journey and her portfolio visuals as a lingerie designer turned textile des designer, which was feature featured by Adobe at the ITMA textile show in Barcelona and at Adobe Max in Los Angeles. She also will be showing us, uh, showcasing her workflow from digitizing hand sketches in Adobe Illustrator so they can be used in fabric design or used in laser cutting. If you stick around, you, you will walk away with her best tips for sketching an idea or motif by hand that will translate easily into Victor Art using Adobe Illustrator software. And that's not all. She will be demonstrating how to make the motif into a repeating fabric pattern and how easily the same motif can be made into laser cutting or engraved program. All of these does not require you to have prior experience with Adobe. So that is really, really awesome. Now, without further ado, let's welcome Ludi. Hi, thank you so much for having me here. Um, the library being one of my favorite places on earth. Um, yes, thank you, Vivian, for introducing me and the team that's been helping me get on here live and just um, really making this comfortable. So um, yeah, I... Um, I am a textile designer now, and I started in the lingerie industry. Mm -hmm. And I would love to share with you guys um, my journey there. And then um, I think we have time at the end for a Q&A. So please don't be shy and ask me any questions. I know there's a lot of different things coming at you. And also the slideshow in the link in the descriptions, you guys can download anything. So if you wonder, where to click, it's in the slideshow as well. And yeah, let's get started. <laughs> if we can start right here. Yes. Yeah, so first of all, once again, thank you for anyone watching this, whether you're watching this live and you're taking the time out of your day to be here with us, or if you're watching this later on, um, I really appreciate that the Los Angeles Library has invited me in. And it's actually interesting because I teach at a community college in Los Angeles and I took our students to the Octavia Lab where they have a laser cutter. And I'll show you guys later how you can use Adobe Illustrator to make your own designs into a laser cut ready um, file. And I don't know exactly how much time we'll have because I have two ideas that I want to walk you guys through. But uh, Illustrator and Photoshop have just really been with me my entire career. So let me just show you how I've used them and kind of simultaneously talk about my experience in the industry in LA and the fashion industry. So 
when I was starting out, I actually was like a clueless assistant lingerie designer. And I had no idea of all the opportunities that there are as a creative in the apparel industry. So through the years, um, I worked as a freelancer. I worked as a cat artist, which is literally just a computer aided design artist. I really loved working as a colorist. And then finally, I pivoted into textile design, which I kind of didn't really understand how you would make a whole career out of that in the beginning. And I had really a fantastic opportunity to see my designs in a lot of different stores around the world. Now, in terms of process, one thing that I always like, and this is um, very similar whether I've designed fashion or when I do textiles, is that I always start with research. So sometimes, like in this particular um, freelance project, you even get hired just to come up with concept boards. And these here, um, what's really interesting about them is that you get to set a direction for where the designs are going to go, whether you design them yourself, if you're going to set your own uh, vision and your own kind of direction of the collection. And what you usually do is kind of the look and the colors, and then it goes towards sort of a season. So this is actually interesting because... Um, here you can see one of these boards has to do with laser cutting. And this was a presentation for a company that does only hang tags. And this particular one actually was also for earring cards. So they wanted to come up with really innovative ways to present earrings. So you can now look at earring cards and see that they have different designs. If you never paid attention to that before, there goes some thoughts into that as well. All right, so on to my lingerie designing um, adventures. So what you see here is pretty much like the workflow that I really enjoy doing there. There's a couple of different things. And one of them is you can see here the sketched illustrator art, and it's really tiny. And usually when we start designing, um, some people are really great in sketching by hand. So you might just sketch something really quickly and then you digitize it so that it becomes a presentation. And a lot of times um, when we go to a fashion market, we don't really have the sample in multiple colorways. We might have one sample, like you can see the finished product here at the end. But a lot of times if we want to sell it in multiple colors, we don't really have the garment ready. So we have to sell from what's called a line sheet. So these uh, sketches in the line sheets, they have multiple purposes. So it's kind of like a blueprint for the garment. You um, put together a sample request and you specify how it's supposed to be made. Then you do a tech pack if it goes into production. And then, um, yeah, you also use it as a selling tool for the garments. So the sketching evolution <laughs> is actually uh, really, really important of a designer. Now, here's another example. Um, this here is actually a Photoshop mock-up. So this garment with the trim layout, so there's like these rhinestones, and I know it's really tiny. If you download the slide, you can zoom in. But this is all fake. So it's just a Photoshop mock-up. And we had one garment that we photographed on the dress form, and then we had scanned in the rhinestones, and we just, or I just mocked it up in Photoshop. And here we never even had a finished sample and we sold it to Lane Bryant from the mock-up. And then um, the last example here is just something that I designed and we sold it to Urban Outfitters. And anything that you see here, and um, once again, maybe you can zoom in into the slide if you choose to download it. The polka dots here or even on this design here on it's called the floral bouquet collection and that's because there's a satin ribbon on there and there's tiny roses on the ribbon so once i started working with designing uh certain details such as the polka dot and the reason let me back up a little bit depending on what kind of apparel company you work for they might have a big budget and they can actually purchase the rights to prints, so textile prints and designs, 
Or they might have a really tiny budget or no budget, and then you have to come up with ways of designing your own prints. So I was uh, at one point at a really small company where I designed anything that was visual, I was responsible for designing it. And that's when I fell in love with textile design because any type of rows, and we did all sorts of things. If we did you know, like uh, Christmas pajamas or anything like that, I'm the one who had to put the graphics or the textiles on it. Now, as part of my um, design career, one of the parts that's really, really important is your communication. And one of them that's really interesting is the communication about color. So here's just an example of how a company might actually send us these tiny swatches of colors and say, hey, here, take this and now create a, um, I think this was either Easter or Mother's Day collection with these combinations. So that was kind of where I was slash designer slash colorist because what we had to make sure of is that we print these um, designs and they actually match the colors that we were given on paper. So that's what a colorist does. And there's a lot of other things that colorists do, but that's just one of the examples. And I just wanted to throw that in there for those of you who love color. Now, in addition to working as a designer, one of my biggest and uh, most dear experiences is to actually teach other designers in the industry how to use uh, digital design. So Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator, there's some other software that are going more to 3D that are coming now. and um, What's really interesting is that when I had the opportunity to teach other companies, because I've been in the industry myself, their questions make a lot more sense. So there's this difference between how graphic designers work with software versus how a person that does web design would work with the same software. So when somebody says, I know Photoshop or I know Illustrator, it's really important to know, well, what's your workflow and what do you usually do with that? So not everybody uses the same software the same, the same way. And then my biggest pride is really um, being able to serve, I think we're, I'm now in the thousands, 10 plus years of um, students in the lowest income households in LA, very close to the Central Library in downtown at LA Trade Tech. So transitioning. So like I said, um, anything that was kind of a visual in like pajamas or lingerie um, had to be designed by myself. So here you see like these little swirls and everything. That's all illustrator art and they translate into embroideries. And then eventually I became courageous and I started um, saying yes to um, textile design offers. It's interesting when you put yourself out there. So I have a YouTube channel where I teach Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop, and then people will start asking me, hey, do you need, do you know somebody who can do cats for me? Or do you know somebody who can do textiles? And then if that's something that would interest me, I was able to say yes. And I'm showing this particular one here today because this is exactly the workflow that I'm gonna try to introduce to you guys today. And this is um, how to draw something by hand then let Illustrator digitize it for you. And then um, also let Illustrator make a repeat for you. And literally these origami birds, I just used a little, you know, uh, black thin, um, I think 5.0.5 uh, Stabilo pen. And I just drew it first in pencil until I liked it. And then I just drew over it. So it's as clean as I wanted it. And then I ran it through the software the way that we're gonna do it today. And then um, you can see the end result being these cute little baby products. Then there's also a more intricate way of working in Illustrator. And that would be if you really start loving the software and you want to do more and um, want to be able to understand the questions more deeply. So like questions like, well, I didn't draw this right and I want to now edit these points how do I do this and we're not going to have enough time to go into this I think today we're just dipping our toe in but here's once again communication about like if 
a person hires me and they're like, hey, can you do a flamingo all over print? So here are some examples of like, what kind of flamingo did you have in mind? And do you want the print to be really tight, which is kind of like this draft B, or do you want it to be kind of far apart? And <laughs> I don't even remember exactly which one the pictures that they posted of the designs are very washed out. So I can't even remember which one it was they chose. And then here is, uh, I think, one of my favorite, favorite um, textile designs that I was kind of pushed to do because uh, my client came to me and asked, hey, can you, you know, do a design where we have a peacock? And I'm like, oh, my God. How detailed do you want this peacock to be? And um, here I used a lot of different techniques combined. So whether it's like there's a tool called the pen tool in Illustrator, and then um, also have a digital tablet. A lot of people don't use those anymore because we now have iPads. I still like my tablet with the pressure sensitivity that it's a little bit finer to me than the ones um, on the iPad. And so there is different brushes or different pencils that you can use inside of Illustrator to get your strokes to be as hand-like as you want. So this one was really uh, quite an experience and a challenge for me to do. So I always like sharing that for the process. And I also think it came out right. Now, in terms of um, the layouts here, I think I only shared one kind of uh, repeat option, but... Um, yeah, this is like a, what's called like a half drop where you have the same motive and it just kind of drops off and it might actually be a little like a three quarter drop. And then I believe that the uh, if you look at the actual garment, it ended up being a mirrored half drop. So you have the motive facing each other and then repeat them mirroring each other. So that's really interesting about when you design just one motive that's really talking to you that um, you can literally start experimenting with the help of Illustrator and knowing a couple of shortcuts like copying, et cetera, to come up with different ways that the print flows. So it doesn't have to be just boxy. <laughs> so repeat, repeat, down, repeat, repeat. So that's uh, like a grid layout. So that's um, pretty much the end of what I wanna share here from my portfolio, but um, let me, go into some cool resources that are available to you um, that you can take your own designs and make them into a tangible item. So for example, the LA library, like I said, I took my students there and showed them this laser cutter. And what they have inside of their um, Octavia lab is actually a cutter that can um, pretty much laser cut different material materials as long as it's laid out in a 12 by 16 inch. So you could do earrings or you could do um, belt buckles or maybe you even would want to do, you know, people are selling these little pins all the time and maybe coasters. And just I show you, I'll show you guys an example of a laser cutter experiment that I did years ago with this website here called Ponoco. Um, before I tell you about Ponoco, just letting you know that um, the LA Library has a tutorial page on how to use their laser cutter. Every laser cutter is going to have their own instructions. So it's really important that you adhere to how that laser cutter communicates with the design software that you choose to use. Um, not everybody is a fan of Adobe, so there is open um, source software. So I believe that this uh, link here will take you to their resources and then you can choose um, even a free openware software. And if you have experience with that, you can then lay out your files in there. Let me go back here. So then um, Ponoco is actually an online laser cutting marketplace. And I haven't used them in years. I can show you the example that I did years ago. But um, from what I understand, they've just become, I believe they started out in New Zealand, but now you can actually get your designs uploaded there, choose which material you would like your laser um, cut items to be made out of. And then they will 
work with the closest laser cutting facility to you, which um, will definitely help you with your shipping cost and all that stuff. And what's nice about this, I believe um, as long as the Octavia lab can, I believe uh, it's not going to really cost you much. You bring your own material in, you have to go there and see what their laser cut, they have a list of um, the material that's acceptable for their cutter. And then on Ponoco, the link that I put there is actually to um, a pricing tool. So the way that I would go about it is I would probably do my first sample hands-on wherever I can go into a maker center. And then if I feel like, oh, I think this is actually doing well and I could maybe do something with it, sell it, be courageous, showcase it, then I would probably go into a mini production and price it on Ponoco and get it running there. Now, the other thing, which obviously um, I'm a fan out of, is the textile design. So that's why I put Spoonflower on here. So when you learn how to do textile designs and repeats, you might want to see your own design on fabric or wallpaper. And Spoonflower is one of these places where you can upload your designs and then they can um, pretty much just send you one yard, which once again, like the pricing of these things usually goes, if you just buy a smaller quantity, the price per item is going to be higher than if you start really, you know, getting into it and you're like, whoa, I need hundreds of these items or hundreds of yards, then the price is going to drop. But it's great for sampling and to just, you know, have a one-off special, I don't know, maybe it's even just a gift for somebody that likes a certain type of character and you did something special for them. Okay, um, the tool that I'm going to use today is Adobe Illustrator. If you've never used Adobe Illustrator, and I'm scrolling too fast, then um, you can start with a free seven-day trial. And then um, one thing that I always get asked is what my favorite book is in terms of learning Illustrator. And uh, really because mine is so specific to either textile or fashion, I rather just uh, you guys go to the Adobe free Illustrator user guide. And whenever there's a tool that you don't really know or remember how to use it or where to find it, you can just go to that entire guide and put it into their search box and you'll get a bunch of options um, to read about what it is that the tool does. And they do a really good job that they also embed now mini tutorials so that you can sometimes even have practice files with them. And what's great about it is that the software changes so much. So it used to be that they had a release every year and a half or so. And since they went to the cloud and it's now subscription-based, they're coming up with more releases. So sometimes a tool goes away or a tool comes back. So this is kind of like the most up-to-date that you're going to get in terms of what all the changes are. And then for those of you who are absolute beginners, like for example, today, the way that I'm going to set up my workspace, you can have, like I said, these software, these Adobe Illustrator and Photoshop software, they are being used by multiple industries. So the windows that you're going to use are going to be entirely different from somebody who's going to do a different web design workflow. Sometimes people do calligraphy and then all that kind of stuff. So what we need to do is make sure that we only manage the windows and panels and set up our workspace to the things that we want to do. And this helps also reduce like anxiety. It's almost like when you um, set up, I always like to compare this to when you start sitting at your desk and you're like, today I'm going to do watercolor. It's going to be really cluttered and confusing if you have glue and newspaper and you have still all your work from collaging there. So you might actually just pick the right size paper, just have your water, you just have your brush and the paint. So that's maybe three windows. And that's kind of how I like to um, talk about customizing your workspace. So think about what you want to do. Think about what you learned, what you need. And then you don't need to look at all the other stuff that seems to be a very intimidating and very um, overwhelming. So you get to save your own workspace and so forth. And um, if you forget how to do this, you can definitely click on the link right here. And it's called Customize the Workspace. 
And it shows you a whole bunch of other things there too, if you want to dig deeper. All right. And then um, just before I jump into Illustrator to start the demonstration, I just wanted to tell you guys how many of the sources at the LA library, I always tell my students and everybody who will listen to me that I'm using. So for example, with your LA library card, you have access to um, Overdrive slash the Libby app. And I come from a generation where we still held paper magazines and we would cut out the images. And I know everybody's now on Instagram and Pinterest and yada, yada, yada. But these curated uh, fashion magazines are just so great to see. And when you uh, log into, for example, Overdrive, you have here the international selection of magazines that you, in the past, I remember I used to drive to the only place that had international magazines in Hollywood <laughs> and try to get like a Japanese or, you know, like a French Vogue. So here you have them at your fingertips and you have it for free. Um, in terms of movies that are, I mean, I guess Canopy has become a little bit more mainstream, but Canopy has some of the most visually uh, fascinating movies. And there's like some really interesting things uh, inside of uh, Canopy where it might just be a snippet uh, from a process that somebody did in textiles from 1960s or something. It's really always changing and always really interesting. My tip for this is <laughs> you get nine credits per month of what you can watch. So sometimes it's a really small snippet. I would Google it to make sure that I cannot watch it for free on YouTube before I use my credit. I'd rather use my credit for a full length movie here on Canopy. So just a little heads up on that. And then um, one more. So me working as a fashion um, professor as well. So whenever I would use uh, the New York Times, for example, for fashion history courses that I put together, I would really lean into the not just the public New York time that's current, but the time machine. So if you've never used a time machine before, I actually linked to an article here that was like two views on mass production, which is Gandhi versus Ford. And um, I really thought, you know, wow, this is all available to us. It's um, from 1851 to 2002. You log in once again, um, there's two ways. You have to first log in through the LA library and then once you're in, you can actually click on this image if you don't know, or Google Time Machine for New York Times. And you have so much power at your fingertips. So those are like my favorite resources that have helped me as a designer, as an instructor, and just also creatively keeping my cup full. I hope you guys enjoy that. And uh, excuse the background noise. <laughs> All right, so let's go. And then, yeah, so... How to stay in touch with me, um, you can download definitely this uh, slide and then you have all my contact information. And there is also a link to a file that will show you different lines that you need to use in order to use the laser cut at Octavia Center. You can customize that file. It's not going to work for you if you have like a really big design that you want to laser cut, but it just shows you which line weight has what purpose in laser cutting. And I know that makes no sense until I just now hop over into Illustrator. So let's do that. And yeah, let's keep going. So let me just get out of here and straight into Illustrator. Okay. So here I am now in my um, opening screen for Illustrator and it greets me because I'm logged in. And what I'm going to do is just like I said before, I'm going to create a new document. And this new document is going to be pretty much like um, going to your shelf and saying, hey, today I want to design a letter sized poster. Or maybe you're like, you know what, today I just feel like doing a tiny postcard and I just want to do some watercolor on there. Now, there's different ways of creating a new document. My typical workflow is to go to File, New, or learn the shortcut. I'm big on shortcuts. And that would be Command-N, 
or control N if you're on a PC. So command is for max. And then you get another option here. And this one here is actually for um, print uh, mobile. Like I said, once again, there's different industries that use the same software. I usually take everybody to print. And then there's also templates you can explore. But we're going to stay in letter. And then inside of um, letter, if you want to really understand your measurements, make sure that you change this to inches if you are in America or into uh, our centimeters if you are in any other part of the world, really. <laughs> and then you can also um, change the orientation. I would not recommend typing anything in here. Just go with what's given to you and then just um, change it to inches. Raster effect is really not that important because we're using vector art inside of Illustrator and vector art um, is resolution independent. Only if you want to eventually share this for your portfolio, you need to think about how you want to export this to make it visible for anybody as a JPEG. But for now, I'm just going to leave it as what it is and then press Create. And I think we can actually take my face off to give uh, more room for Illustrator. That'd be great. Thank you so much. And then I just have to do something here. Sorry, you guys. My two screens are having an issue. <laughs> Let me get back to Illustrator and pull my tools over here. There we go. This little tool palette was hiding on the other side of my um, computer, which is my second monitor. OK. All right, so I talked about the workspace setup. And what's really interesting is how inside of your document, when you first start off a document, um, who, whoever or however Illustrator installs or whoever used it last, it's going to show every tool that they used and every window that they use. So for our workplace, workspace and our workflow, I want to keep it simple. So let me show you what I want you guys to have. So really important for not missing a beat here is the control bar. So watch this. If I cl uh, click on control, this bar on top is going to go away. So I'm going to bring that back. And this here is contextual. That means whenever I bring something into Illustrator and I click on it, it's going to change the options depending on what it thinks. It predicts what I want to do with it. And it's pretty accurate most of the time and knows what I'm going to do with the artwork. Now, in terms of um, laser cutting, laser cutting is always going to require that we have outlines. So everything that we draw in Illustrator is going to have an inside, which is called the fill, and the outside, which is called the stroke. And the stroke is actually uh, able to become really thin or really thick. And that is really important for um, laser cutting. And for laser cutting, you also need to uh, pay attention to the color. And each color actually has a code right here. That's a hex code. And um, yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit more in the future. Now, a couple of things that I usually have open is so a stroke. Our layers, our navigator. Our navigator is great just in case we uh, get lost somewhere and we just want to quickly come back to our paper because we have all the scrap extra area that we can put things on. And then as soon as we start working with color, color is going to co come up anyways. So we might as well leave it there. So let me show you again. Under window, you can see here, you can pause this and you can see uh, everything that has a check mark that needs to be open. Now, I'm going to show you guys really quickly a couple of things that um, I have done with um, my prints from um, actually drawing them by hand. So I'm just going to bring all of this in. Actually, that's not how I wanted to do it. So under File, I'm going to go to Place. So that brings it into this document instead of opening up five documents. And then I'm just going to click, click, and drop them. So each one of these is just going to get dropped right in here. Let me just zoom out. You can see here, uh, this is an artwork 
artwork artwork <laughs> that I drew by hand. And this is inspired by leaves that I saw on the ground or like just any old butterfly that you see out there. And this here, these are all high quality scans. Once I sketch it by hand, became, and now I get to zoom in, became actually this print for this baby clothing right here. So you can recognize the butterflies. You can see some of these flowers and some of these really, so there's two different butterflies and different leaves. And these are, you know, like walking in nature, taking pictures and just then sketching them by hand. And I'm gonna uh, just show you guys how to use these and, um, probably only have time right now to do one of them. So I'm just going to click here and delete these. And the reason I like placing these into an eight and a half by 11, rather than opening it, if I scan this at a really, really big size, then what happens is that the document will open up at the size that I open. But I want this butterfly to actually uh, fit into my eight and a half by 11 and become pretty much super small. And what I'm doing here is I'm using my selection tool and my selection tool here, when I uh, click on an image, it can move it around. And if I come here on the corner, you can see that it has different symbols to change what it can do. So it can actually, if I see this diagonal on the corner and with shift, I can actually shrink this by clicking and dragging with my mouse. And then what I'm gonna do, and I'm just gonna delete this. This was just so you guys can see what you can make with this. I'm gonna show you how quickly, in this little bit of time that we have left, I can let Illustrator draw this for me. Okay, so let me click away and you see how this control menu right here is contextual, right? So clicking away means I have a brand new document and Illustrator is assuming you're probably gonna draw something from scratch. However, I brought something in. So if I click on it, so make sure you're in your selection tool and the shortcut for that is V as in Victor. When I click on this, see how the control bar gives me options? Like it's saying, hey, do you want to crop it? Do you want to mask it? Blah, blah, blah. What we really want is image trace. And this is uh, your million dollar button. <laughs> so I'm going to click on this image trace and it says, blah, blah, blah. It might take a little bit because this is quite a large image. So I'm going to be like, okay, that's fine. And it's going to now draw it for me. And there it is. So this is my in-between step. So as long as we still see this X around it, it is actually just kind of a preview. So I cannot yet go in there and put uh, different coloring in there. So what's really tricky so if you have to pause and look at this a couple of times is what we really want right now is this panel right here. It's called your image trace panel. And in this image trace panel, and this depends on the type of drawing that you brought in, you get to now choose if you wanna use any of the presets or if you just wanna toggle down this advanced option here. And if you want to uh, do a couple of things. So for example, for me, I want to ignore the white. I don't want Illustrator to draw the black and the white. I just need the black line. So let me show you the difference by putting it over here. You guys see that? It's hard to see white on white, obviously. So if I say don't ignore white, it will image trace the inside and the outside. So that really depends. Like if you have an idea to later come in and give each of these triangles a different color, you might want to keep the white. But for me, I just want the line art. So I'm just going to say ignore the white. And it also um, slows down Illustrator if you have more anchor points. And this is going to go more into technical details. I really just encourage you guys to scan your image at 150 DPI, which is like a medium quality and then just start playing around with it and then um yeah see what you like as a result now i'm gonna go here into presets and actually um 
show you guys some of these that look really scary. So if I do sketch art, actually sketch art didn't look bad today. Uh, line art. So that sometimes results in really strange things if I press line art. And then let's do technical drawing. And then you can, um, if it doesn't give you any result, you can still play with the threshold to see kind of like, okay, let's move that up. So it's gonna give you more, <laughs> not a lot more. So let me go back to my best one for right now, I believe was, let's try silhouettes. And then for silhouettes, you can see here how the threshold is way too high. So you can actually move that down. So don't be scared if it looks weird in the beginning, just kind of play with your settings here. And that looks actually really good. So um, some of the other settings before, they didn't give me enough of the details around. So I felt like I was losing some of my details. So do you guys see that right here? So uh, Illustrator really likes a strong contrast. So if it's black against white and then thicker lines, not too thick depending on the detail, but if I zoom in here, you can see here that some of my scallop around the edges is not close. So that means I need to make the threshold a tiny bit thicker. So I don't want you guys to get uh, really frustrated if your first result doesn't come in, you have tons of options to refine this. So in terms of time, I'm just going to do what needs to happen next, which is I need to expand this. So this here, as long as I can still edit all these options here, we're not yet fully vector. So I'm going to expand this. And once this ex is expanded, that's when you actually get to click on these objects here and you get to see how Illustrator draws. So these are all now all vector. And once it's vector, then you can see here this, because I ignored the white, I should be able to click in here and uh, change the color. One thing that could happen to you is that um, it could be stuck in gray mode. So we're just gonna go to edit, edit colors. And then we have something called adjust color balance. And all we need to do is Make sure your preview is on and take this out of grayscale. And we can just say convert. And then as soon as we start pulling on these, you can see here how it allows me to do different colors. And they're driven by this field right here. Now, if I swap this over, watch this. Then it becomes all just the outline of every single element that was drawn for me which is quite scary. <laughs> um, there are things called simplify. If you want to put that through the search term to reduce the anchor points, there are things that you can use later, which are, uh, for example, smooth tool, because really we don't, especially for a laser cutter, for textile design, I don't mind, but for a laser cutter, we don't want to have thousands of anchor points because the laser cutter is going to have a hard time. You want to have the least amount of things for that. But let's just say I'm happy with one motive. You know, I want to show you where the magic, the second magic is. So you have image trace, which allows you without really knowing how to draw an illustrator, take your artwork from hand and have it digitized. And then the second magic, and let me close my image trace here, is um, if you go to object, and it's hidden, but if you go to object, pattern, make, you get this wonderful pattern option tool. And um, for this one, it opens up your swatches palette because that's where our textile design will live later if we wanna apply it to an eight and a half by 11 rectangle or something like that. And this pattern option here, like I said before, will help you with your layout for a repeat. So the first one it gives you is grid, which is super boring. <laughs> Then we have um, like a half drop. So you can see here the brick offset. OK, 
can show you, you know, you can do a quarter offset, which is not a lot. Usually people do a half. And then what's really amazing about it is that if you click on your artwork, you can actually, with option drag, make a copy of the artwork, maybe give it a smaller version. And whatever you do here, so if you learn Illustrator really well, you can also, let me just, for all demonstration purposes, just draw. Like, so here's a different color. But whatever I draw now, while I'm still in this gray out mode, and you can see here we're in new pattern mode, whatever I draw here, it's going to get added to my design. And it's going to be part of my textile. And with my selection tool, I can move that around. And I can, oops, I didn't really want to do that. Let me just group some of these things here together. So that it moves as one. And then I can try some other ones. The more advanced ones here are the hex by column. So that gives you a really amazing um, tile to work with. And you don't, I don't personally like to size the tile to art. I like to be able to uh, move my art around and for me to see the repeat inside of whatever tile they gave me. And then um, there is a pattern tile tool here, which allows you to make your bounds of your repeat bigger. So if you want to put more design into this area, you can fill it up, you can put draw more things in and make this really, really beautiful. So this in itself used to take so much time. It required a little bit of math and matching the edges left and right. And now you get to do this with just the click of a button. And once again, if I want this to be a tight repeat, I click on this uh, pattern tile tool here and I just grab these edges and I bring this closer together. And you can see your preview. And your preview of your print is based on how many copies you want. So you want to make sure you don't just see one and one. Then you're going to be really disappointed. But maybe like a five by five. So you can see, oh, wow, look at me. I'm a textile designer. <laughs> All right. And then when you like it, it actually says um, save a copy. And you can give it a name. Maybe you can say a uh, trial. I know because I manipulated it, it's called a two, two fifth drop. It's actually not a drop, it's brick by row, but that's okay. And I'm going to say okay. And then it's going to look as if nothing happened. I'm going to say done. So now everything is gone, and you're like, no, where did it go? But to use it, it's actually in my swatches. So then what I need to do is use my rectangle tool, make sure your fill is on top. So you click on the fill so it's active on top. And if I double click with my rectangle tool, I can do a little test area. So let's say I want a 10 by five, just a random number, let me zoom out. And then in my 10 by five inches, I click on the design that I just did. And there it is. So I know this is really fast, <laughs> but hopefully you can slow down the video and just try some of this out. I'm just going to go ahead and um, show you a couple of laser cutting things here. So this artwork here uh, is probably a little bit too complicated. I'll show you guys a couple of things here that I have done. So. Um, So this is a paper sketch. And this is like an idea that I had for, you know, between my lingerie uh, background. So I really like the idea of uh, a lot of fine details and like maybe lacing openings. So I actually um, drew this 
with the pen tool inside of Illustrator. And by the time I took it into Illustrator, it became a little bit different. And then I had this uploaded to the website I showed you on Pinoco. And here is um, the example of what it actually became. So it became like a little bracelet. So where you could weave like a little ribbon through. And what we have here, and this is important in terminology for a laser cutter, is we have a cut edge on the outside and we have little cutouts inside. And then we have what's called etching on the inside. So these little positions I etched in here because I glued rhinestones on there. Okay. Um, there is a shoe company called Allbirds and they have a really cute little um, giveaway and here I wanted to just share this. So this all rose, no thorn is actually in the Pasadena store that they used to give away for Pasadena being the city of roses. So you can see here, um, they used a really intricate uh, pattern in the wood, which lends itself for this beautiful pin. This is actually a pin. And then there's a lot of etching. And then there is uh, also the cutout of it. So the file, that you can download from me, um, this one here for Illustrator, shows you what type of color. So the laser uh, cutter at the library will actually base what the laser decides to do with your art on the color. So for example, the etching needs to be done in a fill of true black. The cut line, needs to be this coat in red. And the score line is just, uh, it's not fully etched, but it's just the outline is in this blue right here. Now you wanna be careful to not put a cut line on the inside unless you really want a tiny detail of a hole. So it takes a little time to learn this. So what you can do, uh, let's say you brought your own design and you can copy this command C or uh, control C and you can paste this into this file here. And then um, right now, I don't think this is set up the right way for me to do, to be honest. Okay, this would all be cut lines, which is too much, but let me ungroup it and see if I can only get the outline. All right, so now I release the compound path. Okay, here's the outline. And there is something inside of your Illustrator called your eyedropper tool. So if you press I, you can then just click on the line that I provided for you. And oops. And then it applies it to your design. So these laser cutter lines are so skinny that it's really, really scary. Uh, because you can't see it, but you want to just zoom in and make sure it's that. But that line right here, and you can see if I double click here, here's that code for the color. So, let me make sure that didn't look like the right code. So it took this uh, thin part of it, and I know we're ending this here soon, so feel free to also email me any questions that you have. But um, yeah, the thinness of the line you can read over here in your stroke, which is 0 0.007, and then uh, the color code is actually, if I go to RGB255, and then zero for green and zero for blue. So yeah, that's not the same as the hex code. So forgive me, that's RGB here. So that's 255, zero and zero. And that's how you can understand what does what, but like I said, you have this template and you can uh, eye drop different areas that you want to do different things. The only thing I would say is make sure that you don't have that many anchor points. And I know I'm running a little bit fast, but the last tip I'll give you is um, under edit. 
no, sorry, object, path, simplify. You can play with that and expand that. And you can see here uh, how to make this design a little bit simpler so you don't have that many anchor points. And you can see the original had 3,957 anchor points. And now by simplifying this, maybe it's not so great anymore, but you can play with these options. I'm now down to 421 anchor points, which would, the laser cutter will be very happy for such a design. Okay, so quick run through. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you for letting me do this. I love geeking out over this stuff. And yeah, um, if you guys want to ask me questions, I'm here. <laughs> You you muted Vivian. There, there we go. go. Okay. <laughs> all right. Sorry about that. Wow. But thank you so much for sharing with us. So with all these like really awesome work that you're doing and walk us through the steps to create a motif and patterns. Um, that's like just really interesting and fun watching you going through the steps and on, you know moving all the the cursors on the screen. And I'm definitely going to try that million dollar image tracing button that you mentioned. <laughs> yeah, there's two million dollar buttons between the yeah. pattern yes. creation and the image trace. It's really precious. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I'm going to try that. And I'm definitely I, I'm, I'm actually I have a little bit of experience working with um, Illustrator, but not like very, very good. So I'm definitely going to rewatch this recording and try to learn some tips from there. Now, awesome. um, for all the audience today, if you are interested in getting a copy of her slides, please email us. Or um, we would also put the link in the chat right now that you can, um, hopefully the chat will be there and you can you get, oh, go ahead and click from there as well. So now let's see, we are we only have three minutes left, left so let's um, find one really good question from our audiences here. And um, let me see what we have. Give me one second. So I'm going to scroll through all the chats we have. So um, one question we have is from Rainy Wood. Uh, what inspired you to start your career as a lingerie designer? <laughs> that is so funny because I was pushed into it. I couldn't find a job in the fashion industry. <laughs> no, and then I loved it. To be honest, um, when I graduated, I went to FITM myself and um, I uh, interviewed at so many places and they uh, I knew Illustrator and I was really good at computer aided design before it was really the norm the, it's been the norm now and most places wanted me as a freelancer they mm. wanted they were like oh cool you can uh, work as a freelancer so I started having a lot of freelance experience before I got my first full-time job and it just so happened that um the lingerie place that I interviewed at um she was already using Illustrator, so she wanted me as a des uh, assistant designer under her, and I just kind of fell into it, and I loved it, and then I stayed in it for years in different companies, and I was ever so grateful. I felt like all the other doors that didn't open, they uh, were just not meant for me because I really fell in love with the tiny, delicate, intricate trims, and like I said, the textile design that I was able to experience through working in that industry. I didn't know I, you know, because uh, the fashion program at that time didn't train us for textile design. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, sorry. It didn't train us for lingerie design. So my mind wasn't even open to that industry. But we have a, a we, here in LA, we have a lingerie industry, a smaller sector. Mm -hmm. But um, I recommend it highly if anybody wants to do it. I loved it. Awesome. And we have several questions so i'm gonna pick the one because we only have one minute left um mm -hmm. and i i'm personally very interested in this question from kathy k as well mm -hmm. as a long one so um there's a lot of discussion about sustainable fashion and textile design yep. what do you think about that and do you put environmental sustainability into your consideration when you create your design it's actually one of the reasons i left the industry to be honest um mm. i could not um Put it in my consciousness to have like this really cheap garments being shipped over here all the time at a really cheap um, pricing mm -hmm. 
-hmm. However, uh, when I left the industry, it wasn't as much available as it is now. I, mm -hmm. um, I teach textile sciences at LA Trade Tech. And every time I um, run that course, I have to keep updated with what's happening. So um, it's almost become, you know, you can almost not have a business that's successful without having transparency about what it practices that you are incorporating into how you treat your employees, where you're sourcing, who's creating your garments. So yes, the um, when I create my designs, um, I didn't get a chance to work during the time that that I knew how to work with it. But for example, one of the exciting things that Levi's is doing that I know is that they now can laser their washes. They know um, one of the most chemically uh, polluting things is that, you know, when they had people sand the denim and it would actually get into people's lungs mm -hmm. and hurt them and people could die from it. So mm -hmm. now there is laser technology that can etch and make denim raw and create holes and all that stuff. So I think a lot about it. Um, yes. So if I was to re-enter or take on a freelance project, that would be definitely something mm -hmm. I would have to learn on the spot to kind of incorporate and know what the customer's budget is and all that stuff. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. All right. So it is 501. And with all the questions we have left, we will probably have those questions sent, email it to you. And okay. um, so thank you. Um, thank you You're again so welcome. much, Ludi, for, for the awesome, awesome presentation and, and the uh, instructions on how to use Adobe to create a beautiful, interesting motif. And um, so, um, we're just really interested in learning how uh, learning about you become a, a maker and also a professor now and a designer now. Um, and so thank you again for joining us this afternoon. Um, now I want to invite all of you to please join me on Thursday, May 19th at 4 p.m. for Rice, a pop history of age. Oh, sorry. A pop history of Asian America from the 90s to now. And also we have another program after that. Um, that is going to be on Friday, May 20th at 4 p.m. with young adult writer E. Lockhart as she discusses DC's comics' newest Jewish superhero, Whistle. Now, thank you all again for watching, and we look forward to seeing you on Zoom tomorrow, and have a wonderful evening, and good night.